Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Okay, we're back for the wrist flexors. So, let's talk about the wrist flexors. Having a look here at this picture, some of the things that we can identify is we can see the thumb, and we know that that is lateral. The radius is also lateral, and therefore we would find the lateral epicondyle here. This is where our extensors came from in the previous video, whereas now we are looking to take the origin of our muscles from this side. Now, whilst we don't have a position to draw the muscles in for muscles of pronation, I'm still going to do that on this video because there's a good way to remember the muscles which come from this region via a small mnemonic that we can talk about soon. So I'm also going to put pronators here as well and pronators. So therefore we're going to have pronated teres. We're going to have flexor, not extensor, but flexor carpi radialis. Palmaris longus, that one that not all of us have, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Now to put all, all of these on one picture is going to be tough, but we can manage it. So putting in pronated teres, it's going to be coming from actually slightly above the medial epicondyle here, and it wraps around and across and onto the radius, so that as it pulls, it's going to pull the radius over the top like that and create pronation of the forearm at those radio ulnar joints. Flexor carpi radialis coming like this. Its muscle belly will pass down and its tendon will go down and in through here outside of the carpal tunnel to attach to the base of the second and the third metacarpals. Now, if you have a look back at your extensors, you would notice that we had extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis, and these attach to the base of the second and base of the third metacarpals respectively. So we have our flexor doing the same thing, but via one muscle belly instead. Palmaris longus is a long, skinny muscle, which you'd find sitting in the middle and its long tendon is that one that comes superficial through into the wrist, not covered by the retinaculum, and that's why it sticks up out of our skin. And it would insert not into any bone specifically, but actually into something we call the palmar fascia. Now, if you remember from when we did the foot, we talked about the plantar fascia, and here we have the palmar fascia, and they are similar in their structure. Finally, flexor carpi ulnaris coming from the medial epicondyle and it's going to pass down and it will attach to the pisiform here and to the base of the fifth metacarpal. Now, we said in the video about the nerves that we had flexor carpi radialis innervated by the median nerve. We would also have pronated teres by the Median nerve, palmaris longus by the median nerve, but the flexor carpi ulnaris by the ulnar nerve. Moving on to the flexors, here we're going to put in the superficial. So this is going to be flexor digitorum. superficialis and its nerve is also going to be the median nerve. Now no surprises where this muscle is going to originate. It's going to originate from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and it's going to pass down and insert into the intermediate phalanges of each of the fingers. So it has a long muscle belly, occupies quite a lot of space but it also attaches here to the radius. So passing underneath it 
would be the median nerve and some arterial structures but in this case we're not going to worry too much about that its tendons come down and they're stacked like this as they pass through the carpal tunnel so your middle finger and index finger are on top and uh, oh sorry middle finger and ring finger on top index finger and, th and pinky finger below it's then going to pass out and attach like a pitchfork to the individual intermediate phalanges of each finger. Now the reason why it does this small pitchfork is so that for the next layer, flexor digitorum profundus, that it's going to be able to pass underneath. It's going to pass through that pitchfork like a small tunnel, going to pass through and under and go all the way to the distal phalanges. So let's have a look at that. Putting in the next set of muscles is we have flexor digitorum profundus which has both median and on the nerve innervation so the lateral half will be median and the medial half will be ulna and then flexor pollicis longus in this picture as well so putting in flexor digitorum profundus this muscle doesn't come from the medial epicondyle, except takes its origin from primarily the ulna and a small part of the interosseous membrane. Its four individual tendons will pass through the carpal tunnel uninterrupted all the way to the distal phalange of each of the fingers. So long tendons passing through and then it's muscle belly up here like this then something else that we'll find going through the carpal tunnel there is flexor pollicis longus that originates from the radius like this passes through the carpal tunnel and then all the way to the distal phalange of the thumb so there we go again we have the flexor pollicis longus tendon coming to the distal phalange of the thumb which we would also have found the extensor pollicis longus going to the distal phalange of the thumb also. Flexor pollicis longus, uh, its innervation is the median nerve. So just as a reminder about our carpal tunnel, let's have a look at these wrist bones here again. So what we can see here is we've got the pisiform and the scaphoid. Oh, sorry, the trapezium and the scaphoid, and the pisiform on the medial side, and the hook of the hammer here. So if we look at the, the bones this way, we can see that the trapezium and scaphoid, pisiform and hammer here, make the lower part of the tunnel. So we're going to find there the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis, tendons of flexor digitorum profundus, flexor pollicis longus, and the median nerve passing through here. And then we would know that the deep band of the flexor retinaculum would be passing across where my finger is here to make that fibro osseous tunnel. All right, very good. Let's have a go now at labeling these muscles on the actual picture. So these are the images that you're likely to get to be labeling in your test scenarios. All right, so please make sure that you know how to label these pictures. So some of the structures that we can see here on these images. This one, we're looking at the extensor side. Now, how do we go about doing that? We can see that these tendons here aren't passing through any carpal tunnel. They're just passing freely across into the posterior aspect. You can see the extensor digitorum tendons here, how they're all shared. We did that little trick in the, in the class where you can't move your ring fingers apart when you put your middle fingers apart together. We can also see here, this is the olecranon process, all right? And this is the thumb. So if we're looking at the thumb, we know that this way is lateral, and therefore the muscles are originating from the lateral aspect of the humerus and therefore the extensors. So to label these guys here, we have extensor carpi radialis longus. Then you can see it's shorter 
brother, just deep to it here. If you follow those tendons down, you can see that they attach to the base of the second and the base of the third metacarpals respectively. So from our previous drawings, we know that this has to be extensor carpi radialis longus and this to then be extensor carpi radialis brevis. We can see here then that major muscle in the center coming down here and spreading off into all of the fingers. This is going to be extensor digitorum. And then following down here, this one we can see going to the base of the fifth metacarpal. So we said that going to the base of second and third would be extensor or flexor carpi radialis and going to the base of the fifth will be extensor or flexor carpi ulnaris. Looking at the deeper muscles here, we can still see extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, and extensor carpi ulnaris here, but extensor digitorum has been cut away. This exposes abductor, Polysis longus. Now if we follow that down, we can see attaching here to the base of the metacarpal as we drew in our previous pictures. And we have two more tendons here. This one going to the proximal phalange, this one going to the distal phalange. So if we follow up from the one which attaches to the proximal phalange, we can see that this one here will be extensor polysis brevis. And then the one going all the way to the distal phalange because it is longer, therefore extensor polysis longus. One of the ones you can see here, this little guy, this is extensor indices. So indices for index finger, but don't stress too much about worrying about that one. And just a general reminder again, all of these muscles are innervated by the radial nerve. If we go to the flexor side here, we can see the medial epicondyle is the origin now for these muscles. So we have wrist flexors on this side. Then we have these ones here going off to the fingers. So we know this has to be something to do with digitorum. This one goes off to the thumb. So we know it has to be something to do with polysis. So let's label this one here. Well, follow it down. Origin of medial epicondyle. Insertion more to the radial side. Ah, oh, see here the base of the second and third metacarpals. So therefore we have flexor now. Carpi radialis. This one here coming into the palmar fascia or palmar aponeurosis gives us palmaris longus. And the one on this side coming down to attach to the pisiform, hook of hamate, and base of fifth metacarpal is flexor carpi ulnaris. This one here then, we saw from, the, from our drawing that it came from the medial epicondyle and the radial shaft. This is flexor digitorum superficialis. And then the last two here passing through the carpal tunnel, we can see the carpal tunnel being positioned between the trapezium and the pisiform here. We have flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. All right, very good. I'll see you in the lecture and you can ask your questions then. Thanks.